Good evening, everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. My name is Sabi Ahmad. I'm the Associate Director and Curator at the Ishara Art Foundation, and I'm delighted to welcome you once again on day five of the transformation of our ongoing exhibition titled Growing Like the Trees, Static in the Air. Before I begin, let me just do a sound check. So, Rab, am I audible? Um, yes, Sabi, you are. Uh, thank you. So, um, this is our fifth day of, our, of the opening of Sohrab's exhibition. And the first iteration of the show had opened in January this year. It ran until the 1st of August. And on the 11th of September, we opened the second iteration. The evolution of this or the growth of this happened quite organically. What started off as, a, as an exhibition type of growing like a tree that maps networks, and collegialities between artists, between friends, between people sharing worldviews sometimes, even though they're existing in different parts of the world within different contexts, um, felt like this was a relevant exhibition happening at the moment, and especially in times when distances are being enforced. And then over time, it seemed inevitable that the tree must go into a forest. And that's how the idea of the second iteration came up not as a part two, not as a new chapter, but really as a further growth and something else emerging out of what started in January. And so over a period of uh, six to seven months, the ideas that were percolating between Sohrab, myself, and a number of artists that were participating, I think they led us to thinking of the second iteration in an even more dynamic and agile kind of a form, in, in a form that is not stable, that is not static, that is continuously growing. And in a site of an exhibition, that seems like a little bit of a challenge because exhibitions seem to suggest a site of stability. Works are brought together, they're curated, they're assembled in a certain way, and everyone who visits comes and experiences them in that way. The second iteration, in fact, opens over six days. And as it opens, it keeps transforming for the first six days. Each transformation has happened by an emergence of new clusters of artwork, by a fading out of certain clusters, by a sonic peak in the exhibition, also by certain works that appear as citations, other citations receding. So you have all of these movements, and these movements are these kind of uh, these kind of trepidations, trembling, they happen because the exhibition also sees itself uh, like, a, like a search and a search of radio stations. So the static in the air type really refers to um, a searching of frequencies on the radio, where when you're tuning from one station to another, you hear all kinds of bursts of noise, you hear interruptions, you hear uh, all kinds of static sounds and these sounds engulf you just give me one second we have visitors please come in jopi please come in i don't want to interrupt visitors who are coming we're doing a virtual tour but no no we go on the exhibition continues so um the the switching of radio station which uh, which then opens you to bursts of noise sometimes other radio stations interrupting sometimes a song coming on until you reach a pause with the radio station that you want to stay on. And so those six days of transitions are literally being imagined as a searching of more frequency that we are surrounded by. Today's uh, walkthrough has been thematized, in fact. We've thematized all the walkthroughs. The transformations are not thematized. The transformations are intuitive, they're structural, they're, they're uh, sometimes uh, even, um, choreographed in a performative way to see how the exhibition is, um, uh, is enacting itself. And the theme for today's walk, uh, for today's discussion is Khayal. I'm going to talk a little bit about that later, but what I want to do first is take you through the exhibition and primarily from the focus point of the transformations that have occurred today on day five of the opening. After the tour, we're going to have a conversation with three artists who joined us. Munim Wasif, Ashwari Arumbakam, and Prantik Basu. And these are artists who are, in fact, quite instrumental in the transformation that occurs today. So we'll be in conversation with them. We will talk about Payal, and I'm also joined by Sarah Pura. So thank you all for joining. Let's start the tour, and we'll go in. So the first thing that, in fact, you may notice in these subtle ways is 
that the, the, the orientation of the tables changed. This table earlier had Anjali House photographs, photographs taken by little children uh, who were staying in Angkor uh, in, in Cambodia in, in, a, in an organization called Anjali House. And this is an organization where um, Wasif, Sohrab, and a number of others have been going regularly to do workshops with children, photography workshops. And some of those children have now grown into becoming professional photographers. Um, and their, their work now is dispersed as notations in the exhibition as opposed to being a main work in the show. Um, something that this exhibition has been doing over time is switching the hierarchies from what is the work to what is a notation to what is a citation. And this iteration kind of blurs it further. It's hard to tell which one is really a work. When, and this is, a, this is a gesture, I think, quite uh, important for Sohrab and our conversation that we've had uh, as, as the show developed, because uh, it's also about what does a work really tell you? It tells you about everything that surrounds that work. And so how do you show everything that surrounds that work? It's a bit like when you make all these notes, you scribble all these uh, citations on a book that you're reading sometimes. So how do you make those notes visible in a book? which sometimes is just kept with you and not visible to others. So those kind of notations keep bursting out in the show. So Anjali House now has become notation, we have faded out, and in its place has come uh, a beautiful series titled Intimacy by, uh, by Kushal Ray, who's based in Calcutta and who joined us yesterday. I'm going to just go behind the camera so that I can take you through the work itself. Thank you, Neha. I'm not going to repeat some of the previous day's iterations where we had Zainab exploding out with a cluster, with a notation that, that enlarged with Jaising and his map. In the previous iteration, we had uh, Sohrab's map, which is now faded out. And in place, we have Jaising's map. We brought in Satish, which we saw yesterday. That up there is a notation by Anjali House, a photograph that was earlier placed right here on a much longer tape. The L has changed. We now have a new corner in the middle of the exhibition. Ritu's work, titled Lost Tune, now engulfs the whole space with the sound that is coming from it. It's an ambient sound of disharmonious chords made on a harmonium. We were in conversation with Ritu as well yesterday. If you would have noticed, there was an addresser by Sohrab on this wall. That has faded out as well. You see that in its place, we have Ashwarya's letter, a letter that she wrote and that she will talk a little bit about today. Along with Ashwarya's letter, we, all, we have notation also by Ashwarya right next to them. This is, is uh, surrounded by notation by the packet. And the other sound you might be hearing is the Epson dot matrix printer that is part of the packets installation where uh, it is puttering out these reams and reams of uh, paper, pink paper, and the work is titled, also written and inscribed there, The Heavy Weight of Tiny Little Things. So what else has changed in today's uh, transformation? The pictures, let me quickly show you, are of a family and a home in which Kushal stayed for some years. And we have another work by Kushal on the far end, right there on a small frame. Now that was a wall which until the previous iteration was occupied by Sean Lee a series of photographs titled Two People, where he photographed his parents. And that space of the family was quite important, which continues to be the case with Kushal, except it shows a very different dimension where you have someone, an artist who's living with the family, living in a family. And while that's going on, people as they're going old are also leaving. And as they depart, how does a photographer come to terms with the absence? You will notice that there's also an absence here. There was a citation on a pedestal by Dainita Singh of her book inside and case in a box. This book and this artwork was called Sent a Letter. 
instead of being presented like a like an artwork the way it is practically meant to be seen opened up this book was kept in closed and this box is became an object that was to be read on the pedestal that said sent a letter to my friend and it goes on now addresses are quite important in this exhibition and addresses by various artists speaking to one another speaking speaking across to one another and so are the so is the space of family so is the family space of relationships and this wall is something that actually we kept so rab and i kept finding a lot of gravitas and attention given to familial relationships but as we as we talked further about this show and as we were made more aware that are we really emphasizing so much about family narrative we realized that no it's not about showing the, uh, an innocent side of the family but rather various different relationships that form within which should not necessarily be generalized as familial only it's showing much many more things a work by fara mulla which now has muted so fara's work until now was really pulling in sound and reverberating echoing back to an oral mirror is silent ritu saptas is i think the sound frequencies of her work do not really come through but it really creates a static or an ambient sound you have nepal picture library cluster and notations of shawn now burst out there's a there's a, a photographic image by shawn lee right up there and the note about shawn when shawn and sora first met remains from the first iteration but the photograph has changed and you can see a, a kind of transformation even in the relationship between shawn's parents who were posing in a much more somber kind of attitude in, in the photograph we saw earlier to something that can only i think be treated with humor and sometimes with identification so the transformations that have occurred today are rather subtle but what we notice is it kind of changes the flow of the exhibition until now this was a bit on this side it was a little further off and it became a kind of podium or a counter from where you saw ashwarya's work or from where you read sorab's letters or address them and now as it shifted you just spend time in this corner on its own so if someone may go all around and take a full round go here but also someone may just go around and take a smaller circle just to come in here so you have these concentric swirls that sohrab and i were thinking about as we were uh, considering this transformation the elements of story still remain the elements of sharing history still remain bunu's work remains unchanged but everything around it has changed and that also changes how we think of bunu's So God for Peak's work stays, except now it's reduced in volume, so it does not engulf you in the soundscape that until now took over the entire exhibition, even the outside space. Rahi Punya Shloka's work, which came in after uh, Katrin Koning's work split up, which was earlier on this corner, and a citation by Rock's Media Collective that. the title 31 days that has been inserted so the citation of dynika singh's work has faded out and raksha's work is faded in and the last work that i want to show is munim wasif's work title khayal short film that we will hear more about when we speak to him today is the last day of this film coming to us in this exhibition in its place tomorrow we will be seeing Prantik Basu's film Sati Sona Prantik Basu is also with us so we will be hearing from him now just to quickly tell you a little bit about why we thought of Khayal for this uh, for today's virtual tour every day we've been we've been looking at certain themes certain ideas that 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 seem to have resonated um 
over time, as we were conceiving this exhibition, as the exhibition kept growing and emerging uh, in our minds in conversation with others. And as you could already tell, Munim's Wasi's work is titled Khayal, but it was also an inspiration because the title just suggested so much and the artists that we brought in today uh, have, a, have an interesting relationship with Khayal. For those who don't know what the word means, uh, in Hindi and Urdu, Khayal is often referred to as thought or idea. It's also sometimes used as an opinion that what are you thinking? What is your notion? What is your thought on this? But it is also used as, um, as uh, care, that you, uh, you take care of something. In Bangla, as uh, Wasif clarified for me, it also suggests a kind of reverie that someone has been lost in their khayal and um, they have to be kind of knocked back to the present, that where did you go? What khayal did you, did you get lost in? And so, so Ram actually, just before we started today, said that for him, this, this title suggests mindfulness. And I thought that's beautiful to think about a mindfulness, which also suggests care, which also suggests uh, ideas, thought, all encapsulated into one word. And so we're going to discuss some of these ideas and how uh, Payal is con considered in, in all of these artists' practice and also in this exhibition. So I'm going to end the tour here and I'm going to pass it on to Sohrab. Sohrab can speak a little bit maybe about his idea of today's transformation. Tomorrow the exhibition is going to be slightly different. Some of the clusters will receive and then the exhibition is going to pause. So once Sohrab starts speaking, we'll go into the conversation now. Sohrab, over to you. Um, thank you, Sabi. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining in and thanks especially to Ashwarya, Prantik and Vasif for uh, making time today. Um, I think for me, the most uh, special thing about having um, uh, all three of them being part of today's conversation has been that um, uh, all three for me bring a very different register from the rest of the show. Um, in the first iteration, both Ashwarya and Vasif were, in a way, um, uh, making what I sense as the, um, the borders of image making a lot more porous than we uh, usually see them to be. Um, I think um, in, in thinking about this exhibition, I've been conscious of um, uh, not only where I want it, but I feel like I'm going in my own journey in terms of image making and how I'm seeing uh, my fellow sort of, um, you know, um, uh, photographers and filmmakers and people working with sound, um, also kind of navigating similar um, relationships with the medium. Um, but I, I, I could not actually let go of the baggage which was thrust upon me. So one of them was that uh, this idea of uh, the image being quite fixed. And, um, and for me, um, the three of these uh, artists actually uh, start to break uh, the fixedness of the image. Um, in today's change, um, we've had Kushal, who's um, come in completely. Um, and, and, and Anjali House is faded out. And I, I remember having seen Kushal's work um, maybe about 10 years ago or 12 years ago. And I also remember seeing a book of his and my first feeling about the book was, um, it, it was, it was actually one of the most humbly produced books, but, um, it was also one of the most beautiful experiences. Um, and it has stayed with me. And somehow I think it was also at the time when I was photographing my own, um, mother and to see someone else who had actually gone through a whole cycle of life and death. Um, there was some sort of um, empathetic resonance with um, how um, that journey might have been. And, and, and somehow, um, for me, you know, uh, both Kushal and, um, and Sean brought in a very specific emotional resonance, an emotional anchor within the exhibition. So um, 
you know, which is why as Sean faded out, I, I kind of felt that the presence of Kushal would, um, would, would, would remain in a, in a, in a, in a, in a sort of an emotional way. Um, so I'm just going to stop it here and I'm going to <laughs> give it back to Savi quickly as usual and let him open up the floor. Thank you. Uh, uh, everyone, uh, Basif, Ashwarya, Prantik, let's have our cameras on if you feel all right to do that. Now, if any of you attended the previous sessions, you will, you will remember that we, we would share slides and we would share images of everyone's work while they're talking about them or while they're opening up that work into something else. But today, because at least two of the artists whose works are in this exhibition are video works, um, we're not going to be able to really experience or see what they're talking about. So I really want to open up first by just asking Wasif and Prantik uh, about their film, about their work. Khayal from Wasif, uh, Saki Sona from Prantik, because I hope that that will at least lay the ground for, for the conversation that we will open up. And then we'll also obviously bring Shwarya in. So Wasif, um, your work Khayal, the title is inspired today's conversation. Can you tell us a little bit about this film? Um, what is the film about? What were you thinking about when you made it? Yes, um, thanks Abhi, thanks um, Sorab uh, for this wonderful initiative. Um, first of all it's actually difficult to talk about this that's why i made the film um i was interested uh, about the old part of dhaka for last 16 17 years so i photographed that part of the city for 12 years i published a book and after publishing the book i realized that uh, there's so many things we're missing and I started to ask myself, what is missing? What else you can do after visiting a place for 12 years and still there is a sense of missing. And I started to go there again, but more in a self-reflective way, asking myself that uh, why I didn't manage to capture so many ideas that I was interested in. And I realized that it's, a, it's an idea that, that belongs in my head, in my subconscious rather than uh, in that uh, locality. Uh, and slowly I started writing a script and, uh, and um, trying to reconfigure, recalibrate my relationship and my idea about childhood, about old Hakka and about different things. There is also something to do with medium. I felt, especially in old Hakka, that there are so many things happens in layers, starting with sound, um, then noises, then smell. And I felt that I, I need to transform those senses in a more complex kind of uh, medium. And uh, film was comparatively a little bit uh, easier than for Rafi because uh, there was movement, there was a sound. Um, yeah, there were different registers at sort of said. But for me, Kel was about... Uh, about these four different characters that you see in film who are lost in certain mindset. Um, and um, they're thinking about something else, but they all belong to old Dhaka, but they think about a outer space. But I was also looking at uh, this whole idea of repetitions, which is used in this form of Khyal in Hindustani classical music, where you see a particular kind of text repeating in certain format and at one point you don't hear what is said in those texts rather you hear a different sense of sonic uh, movements and for me that was fascinating that how uh, the meaning of the same thing changes depending on how you frame them uh, how you contextualize them um, so for me it's about um, finding all those uh, things in between which is very difficult to absorb uh, in a uh, how should i say in a more concrete way um, yeah uh, thank you wasif wasif th this work was made between 2015 to 20 
17, no, 18? Yeah, I think around two, three years, yeah. about two, three years. Yeah. Can you tell us about what that duration meant? What was, what is it that made it mm. a two, three year long uh, endeavor? Um, um, uh, so a little bit, uh, which will be, I think it will be very different from prantic, prantic practice. I think in our practice, Sorab can add more. One of the thing I love to do is to go back to the place again and again and uh, start building the work. So basically, we had a temporary studio in Old Dhaka in a place called Beauty Boarding, where we have walked in, let's say, five slots, mostly in winter. And, uh, and one monsoon. Uh, so there was an initial idea how I want to, uh, a two page of text, how I'd like to uh, uh, film the walk, but the walk developed while I was there and encounter, encountered different moments. So um, there is an old lady uh, who sits in front of a window and look at outside. Uh, I just um, found her while I was filming in Old Dhaka. She is actually daddy of a friend, the grandmother of a friend. And when I looked at her, it it registered me that it synced with all the other characters that I was thinking about. So two of the characters, uh, I have casted them. Uh, and two of the characters uh, who lives in Old Dhaka, and I, I just shot them uh, exactly in their location. So there is a very interesting combination of um things which are staged but things which are also found um and um i was um, constantly editing the film in still and also as as moving image so the walk evolved uh, almost like a um, uh, like a studio practice but mm -hmm. studio in a larger sense uh, the location was the studio and the characters were and the environment, environment was informing me to change, to adapt, to, um, yeah, yeah. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to come back to Khayal uh, with you, Wasif. But let's move to Prantik. Prantik, can you tell us what Saki Sona is about a little bit so that at least everyone here uh, has an entry point? So hello everyone and uh, thank you Sabi Swara, for this wonderful walkthrough and very happy to be here and presenting my film. So Saki Sona uh, evolved as a, I started researching on this one excavation site in Bengal, uh, which, uh, uh, in which uh, mon uh, remains of a monastery has been found, which dates back to 5th or 6th century. So I just went to that place to do my first round of research and to see how the excavations are taking place because Excavations, the excavation is something that was particular, of particular interest to me uh, at that point of time. And uh, I heard this one story from a local shop owner who once said that uh, this place is called, uh, the area is called Shokishona at Deep Beach, like the mound uh, was called Sakishona in her, in, by that name. And uh, she said, you know why it is called this by this name? I said, no, why? Then uh, she told me the story that, that there is this local myth about this uh, warrior princess called Sakishona. And uh, she said that if, if you look up stories and look up uh, books and research, you won't find anything about her because it's uh, an oral myth. So I actually started looking up research papers and documentations of myths in Bengal and could only find a, a two paragraph story about it, a very vaguely written a story, its excerpts were there, not like a full-fledged story. So that remained in my mind for quite some time. And meanwhile, I was called to FTII to make a film with uh, the students there. And uh, because I had fragments of this story in my mind, I was unable to get it off my head. I thought, let's try to do something with the excerpts of the story that we have and create like a collage of the fictional bits and put together with the factual bits of it and see what third meaning can come out of that. Because the story itself shapes and reshapes when it is told, like an oral story which travels, it uh, like changes its meaning or uh, its structure with each, with each narration. So the main attempt behind this was to see what new story can come out of the retelling of this, this myth. Yeah. Mm. And the, the myth essentially is about this uh, girl who elopes with her lover and uh, they start living by the woods and uh, in the jungle there is a shaman who has the power to turn uh, people into animals or trees and uh, so that's how the narrative unfolds and there's a 
kind of a vague love triangle there and uh, heartbreak so essentially it is that element of love and pain also which connect which i connected with and wanted to delve into and how was your site site visits like uh wasif described going back to the same place again and again and he described it beautifully by going yeah. back on certain seasons yeah so um, it was quite uh, wasif's experience and mine were similar in certain regards and very different in certain because uh, this is in mednipur which is uh, like in the southwest uh, area of bengal but uh, in fti when we are shooting we, we are given a limitation of 200 km so we have to shoot it in maharashtra and uh, i had visited the site in mednipur quite a few times and uh, when i went back to pune and when we were shooting this film the certain hilly region of maharashtra had a certain similarity with a, a certain section of mednipur or purulia or the, of the landscape of rar bengal which is very rocky and very dusty so uh, we had to recreate that in that place we have photograph references and of course you we can't like create a set of this whole space there so it was in a way a reimagined look uh, of the setting that we were trying to achieve in the film making it in black and white of course gives a certain timelessness to it and also puts it uh, puts the local in a certain ambiguity and this also this film also took uh, a long time uh, like uh, vasis because we shot this film in 2015 and uh, uh we kept on editing it and re-editing it and uh, the fti was going through a month long uh, four month long strike so things were at halt and uh, this eventually the film finally premiered in 2017 so it took like a couple of years in between i kept on revisiting the site the excavation sites in mednipur so there were new findings that were coming up so the photographs that you see in the film those are the findings that were coming up during the film so in the making process Uh, we realized that okay we can't make the film like a full fledged narrative fiction story it has to have those cracks and crevices of an archaeological site like we were also unearthing the story and finding bits and pieces in images in texts and putting it all together like a very uh, handmade film kind of a way so mm-hmm. that was the experience we were going through mm-hmm. thank you pranthik uh and we'll come back to you as well but let's move to ashwarya ashwarya first thing um actually the these visitations to different sites and going there again and again seems to be an interesting recurrence both between wasif's work and prantik's and both of them had captured it through moving images um in your work kadinge you have also made site visits you spent time with people you spent time with children you've also looked into folklores like uh, uh prantik so can you tell us a little bit about uh cutting gate to begin with um what is this what is the work about and then we'll also talk about your letter which has now come in and this work has faded out yeah um so cutting gate is um a story about i guess to put it simply human environment conflict um and it's set in this village like a tiny village of 40 families who are all uh, khasia is an indigenous minority community at the border of india and bangladesh um i've been so i started visiting nama punji in around 2015 uh to step back a bit so like the, the region is quite beautiful and the khasis have had this really long traditional relationship with nature where they kind of position themselves as you could say like stewards of the nature and the land but over the last decade there's been intensive sand mining stone mining in the region and that's really changing things and the effects this mining has is of course like very visibly present in the landscape of the region in the um like in jobs and livelihood but also you can see like the effect or like the repercussions of this loss of land in the mythology and um other as- and culture which was actually even more to me like kind of subtle but also like more troublesome in a way um so i started just photographing there and my process has honestly changed quite a bit since i first started photographing so i my, i try to go except for like last year i couldn't go but i go like once or twice a year to lama punji i spend a couple of weeks there i stay in lama punji like um at a friend's house 
um, when I photographed there. And initially, when I was going to Lampunji, I had a script in mind. Um, so I'd written this story, which was based on like a story somebody had told me at Lama Punji and also based on a lot of research. But then over time, that written script and idea started getting replaced by these images we were making. Um, and the images were made like not just from a pre-established idea, but also from things we would find. Or a lot of time, with, because I work a lot with children and I enjoy it, there's a lot of play involved. Like there would be something happening and we would add an element or like I would want to do something and they would refuse and do something else. Like it would just kind of like I had to be there and the camera had to be there for something mm -hmm. to happen. And um, so those became those images. I became the new script or like they are now the things I'm shooting more based on. So I'm still working on starting it. It's not I'm not like completed it, but yeah, it's at the stage now where it's reached like a certain telling or a certain version, which is mm. being said. Mm. And this is a work that originated as a photo book. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious what led you to, to going that direction, because it could have just as well become a film, the way Prantik and Wasif have been going to the same place again and again. And, mm. Or it could have yeah. been a, a simple photo series or... I don't know, it could have. So what led it to be a book and not anything else? I think I was always interested in the idea of storytelling and the kind of stories I was finding and the format, <laughs> it kind of fell or like leaned naturally into the space of a book, which is more intimate and quieter. And also there is a personal baggage in the sense I was working in the commercial film industry for a number of years and I was terrible at it and I really didn't enjoy working. At that point, I, was, I, I didn't like making films. So I also was really enjoying photography. I kind of fell into photography because I was just so saturated with something else. So I think it came from there where I was just like, I just want this kind of stillness and like silence and also want to be able to do it by myself with in this space I thought there was like I was missing kind of like the touch and the interaction which happens when it's just like one person in with another person in a space versus like a crew of 50 people I think it just changes the dynamics and mm. yeah that's why and last question to you Ashwarya before we move on is who are these children in your work oh there's um they're all from Lama Punji, and uh, this is my friend Dilek's sister. Um, but yeah, they all live, and actually they've grown up quite a bit over the last few years. And now some of them are teenagers, and they're like, "Oh, we can't do this anymore." But they, yeah, they they were kind of my entry point, you could say, into the community because they were up for like taking me around to places. Uh, sharing stories and yeah a lot of the images are based on like their imagination and stuff they told me or like the way they would interpret something their mothers had probably told them mm. so yeah they are from Lama Punji. they're not like actors or anything like nobody's an actor in that Thank sense you. like professional got it, got it. thank you um so Rab, I'll, I'll cir circle you in just as i do with ev every other session which is that even in your land of a thousand struggles, there was a going back to the place again, to some places again and again and again. And um, can you tell us about maybe your relationship with going to places? And the reason this is, I'm asking this, but well, now everyone has, seems to have answered this is because it's also about staying with the thought for a long time. You know, there's some thoughts, there's some questions, there's some ideas that we stay with, that, that stay with us for, a long duration for years sometimes and it's curious that actually everyone in today's panel has at least worked for two to three to five, sometimes even five years on Ashwarya's uh, Kardinge has been going on since 2016 and still going on so um, maybe you can say a little bit about your relationship when you're working and going back to similar places or the same place again and again and what that means for you um, I think for me, there is, um, in my work, I think about going, going to a place and going through a place, um, depending on how deep or how on the surface I want to be. 
um, for example, um, uh, because you made a reference to Land of a Thousand Struggles, where I was on the journey in uh, many of the villages in north and central part of India. This is during uh, uh, the right to food movement, uh, when they were asked, demanding for uh, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act to be levied. Uh, that's when I discovered Party, uh, the place where I've been working for about 15 years now. Um, what I realized was that, um, you know, it's not just going back to a place, uh, but I'm also going back, like Ashwarya talked about how uh, those children have grown up and I kind of have seen so many children grow up and have their own kids now. But at the same time, I think I've also grown up. I've also been changing. So in a way, what's been happening is that um, it's been this long extended, um, um, I mean, I wouldn't even call it work, but it, it's, it's, it's the relationship takes on a different uh, tone, you know, every time. And uh, what's also been happening is that when I first went, for example, uh, on that trip in 2005, I just finished my studies in economics. And, um, you know, I think I was quite brash in the sense that we are taught about how the economy runs and you study about famines and so on and so forth. And uh, of course, you assume that, you know, uh, whatever you studied in your uh, class in the city, um, in a way that can be projected wherever you're going. Uh, and then you realize that actually, um, because I think many of the people here have talked about oral histories, about how that's one way of uh, keeping records that doesn't really get uh, acknowledged that much, especially in maybe the spaces that we come from. Uh, and then you realize how uh, it's reality is very different from what you had assumed. Uh, so for me, for example, uh, uh, I went there in 2005, worked in a certain way. And, and I mean, from here, there's maybe a question I want to ask to Vasif as well, because we both started pretty much together. We were, you know, in Angkor together with Sean in 2007. And um, I think there was a certain kind of work happening, uh, social documentary work. Um, and I was also part of that. And, and uh, in time that started to change, you know, I started to feel like question whether I was part of a certain propaganda, whether I was also in a way uh, existing within a bubble, you know, uh, and then uh, that's where the film Party came out from, which was to kind of shed that baggage and to actually be there and listen to people rather than, you know, me assuming, thinking about issues, you know. Uh, um, and, and over time, I think uh, I've always stayed with someone called Har Singh, who is one of the leaders of the grassroots movement there, um, called Jagrat Adivasi Dalit Sangatan. And... Um, I think the more time I spent, the ordinariness kind of stayed with me a lot more. Uh, I think the everydayness, whereas I think in the beginning it was uh, more in terms of events, whether it was an event of unemployment or an event of, you know, something which could be encapsulated within uh, the realms of uh, economic studies or something that could be, you know, explained to us. So those are the kind of shifts that happen. And, um, I'm in fact curious to know from Vasif um, because I think that we began together and I remember that he was working in a similar vein of social documentary and over time I think I realized that there was also a change in the distance you know with which he ended up uh, making work um, and I would always hear him talk about boredom whenever he was talking about his work he would use the word boredom quite often but not as if he is bored, but boredom being a sort of a, uh, maybe a method, uh, maybe it was uh, a sort of state of existence that one needs to get into to be able to, you know, uh, in a way, be connected to what one is doing. And I was just curious to know if what boredom meant, and I'm asking this more as a friend because I've been listening to him over the years and it's, it's come up. I think even when he did Land of uh, Undefined Territories, somewhere I... I think it, it, it might be something to do with slowness, you know, and that's what I'm saying that um, it, it's what is most visible are these big impactful events, you know, uh, and somehow 
when you step back and there's a different distance with which you're looking, um, maybe boredom is also to do with the everydayness. So I'm, I mean, I just wanted to ask him, you know, what boredom meant for him then and now. You were muted, Wasif. You're mute, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Um, no, um, thanks, Sorab, for the question. It's interesting because while Sorab was uh, speaking and uh, I um, saw Prantik's beautiful film today uh, after lunch, uh, which is a very specific time for me, uh, uh, also because, uh, I don't know, because if I'm Bengali uh, or I live in a certain place uh, of the world where there are certain sense of heat. And I remember um, when I started photography, I actually started going to the tea gardens uh, in Silat, where um, Ashriya walked. And uh, the most important time for me in the tea garden is actually the noon when the light is really harsh and you can't really walk a lot. It's very exhaustive. And the kind of sound uh, or soundlessness you have at that time in the tea garden and also the question of labor and um, exploitive labor, what it does to human bodies and how you look at things around you and what it does to your your brain. I don't know if that is boredom, but that's a very state, particular state of mind which came back in my walk in, uh, in different ways, in different time. And I think for me, that's very crucial when uh, a particular state of mind push you to look beyond what you see and think more and um, reflect in a more intuitive way where the body, mind, and the environment connects uh, subconsciously. Um, and um, I think like in old Dhaka, I went back to a lot of my work, which I have started uh, in early 2000. So let's say 15 years back. And um, I have responded to the same things in a very different way. Like I went back to the refugee camps in the border of Bangladesh and Myanmar, which I have, where I started work in 2009. I yeah. went back to old Dhaka. I went back to the jute mills. And these all have connections to the, what Sorab was saying, the kind of social documentary um, kind of practice. And I will say that I'm very glad that uh, I started uh, looking at these places and looking at things which is beyond me, uh, beyond my surroundings. Uh, but also these places gave me a certain way of understanding the world we are living in. Uh, not completely, but it changes uh, the way I have lived. And I think they, it has more connections to my friend who are mostly activists, leftists, uh, working with... Uh, uh, labor movements um, and uh, I think social documentary was some sort of a language and I'm still uh, walking on that language that how can you really talk about some kind of complex issues sometime which is not representable or very exploitive how you deal with that and I think that's an ongoing conversation um, Yes, but I think with boredom, I think one thing I, we, I would like to draw one, two more things which Ashuri and maybe Pranti can also respond is the one, the question of time uh, and how it blurs sometime between past, present and future and how we can create a narrative which, uh, which create a much more complex conversations, you know, what is future, what is past and what is present. Um, and with boredom, there's also one other thing which is very really important in terms of form for me is the sense of repetitions and what it does, uh, how we look at things. That's why I talked initially about Khyal, where in Hindustani classical music, you keep listening one beat again and again, and you have a completely different uh, way of understanding the same words or the same sounds and how it goes beyond what you hear and hits somewhere really deep inside. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Wasif. Ashwarya, Prantik, do you want to respond to what uh, Wasif has opened up? I 
Ashwarya, maybe start and join me. I'm still trying to. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think for me it's been like quite interesting as a process to kind of let go of something I either thought of, like a pre-imagined something, or something I'm just I see and. It's helped me, like the way I kind of imagine it is, it's like if you like a piece of fabric, if you kind of pull it, like really kind of go close and slowly keep working and working and working, then the weave expands and then things start to like slip in and out, and it becomes and in a very organic way, not like you're trying to do something, but if like the weave is large enough, things just pass through and they don't like stop; they keep going up and down, and that's kind of how I look at. I don't know, like storytelling or viewing time, anything in. Because um, honestly, like I think Sarab also knows, like my memory, like I don't have a very clear way of articulating and thinking. It's all kind of loopy, and so it works. I think for me, like to kind of accept and fall into this process of slowing down and really like spreading things out. If that makes sense. I, think I, I was just trying to remember, recollect what is the opposite of board, what the opposite of boredom would be like. Would it be engagement or I don't know a certain sense of excitement which like keeps us engaged. Which and when that happens, automatically we are uh, seeing or imagining what we are told to see or what we are shown or what we are guided towards. And the moment that information is not there, that uh, that channel is closed in a way with images or sound or with no in, with lack of information coming your way automatically you when you're bored you tend to make up your own meaning or you think of your uh, interpretation of it it opens up layers of your own memory so i think that is what excites me about storytelling or playing with this idea of duty on film because in the conventional sense of storytelling in film it is so much to do with at least in the commercial sense it is so much to do with in keeping the audience engaged and uh, this thing of paisa vasool ke you sit there throughout and what you are getting out of it but after a point as artists or in our practice we are i think uh, we are we are all in a way trying to go beyond this thing of giving excitement or giving information it's more to do with feeling or what what the uh, and uh, also it makes the viewing process more democratic when the audience brings in their stories their memories and their back stories Is the project on what they are seeing? So maybe a shot of like a wind in a tree, and in my film, or a shot of the the, the pole, the electric wires uh, in uh, in Vasif's film. They mean different uh, things in those particular films. When they are put in the context of a still image, or put in another film, they would mean something else. So, uh, so I think that is what is exciting about moving image, or even stills for that matter. How long? How is your gaze guided? With the graphics of still, so the du- the du- duration plays a big part, and that is what the audience also brings in. There is usually a thing of uh, like it is said, na, when uh, like films, especially it happens in terms of films when art house films or so called artsy films are considered to be like more elitist or like for a certain strata of the society. Whereas uh, I've been working with a dance group in Purulia for quite some time. Uh, the performers in in uh, sakisona also and uh, with them uh, i stayed uh, with them in their village for quite a few years and it is so strange that people with no preconceived notions of what films are supposed to do or supposed to be they are more open to engaging with newer kind of cinema which uh, with which uh, work with time differently and uh, again going back to this thing of revisiting i stayed with in that same village for quite a few years and uh, Two of my different works came out of my collaboration with the dance group that you see in this film, and what uh, Saurav was telling about this thing of events or this thing of uh, like an issue or something that is big or once we tend to look beyond that, the mundaneness in a way actually that is where we find the truth and that is where we find our connect with the subject, which makes it more universal maybe or which puts us there and that is where we form a relation with the subject. I think. till then it is the process in the making so yeah thank you you know um with the way you all have described 
uh, the process of making the works that you've made, but also beyond just making the works or how you engage with the subject matter that you're working with, with the people that you're working along with. Um, it reminds me of um, films that were made in Europe and a, a lot of them in, by Italian filmmakers after the Second World War. And there was a whole movement called Italian neorealism with Rossellini, Visconti, a number of people where in the midst of all the rubble of the, uh, that was brought about by the war, you have films made which really don't have much of a plot. The big event is not about to happen. A climax is not about to happen. The climax has in fact just happened. What happens after now? And this was an approach to filmmaking which basically showed scenes, long shots of just someone making tea someone sitting and looking outside a window and you just, or someone just taking a walk and going on and on taking a walk. And there was this kind of an attempt to make cinema that was not necessarily plot driven. And philosophers who've looked at these films and described them also talk about this relationship with a kind of disjointedness between the optic and the haptic faculty, where usually the characters in a, in a film or in a plot are agents, are, are, are entities that will enact and carry forward the plot. Uh, something will happen to them or they will cause something to happen. In this, uh, they're not the agents of action. There's only, they're practically only just going around, just taking in optically. And therefore the figure of the child comes repeatedly in these films because the child is compared to someone who's taking in a lot optically, but is not able to do much haptically because of limited, well, uh, movement faculties or something and so the child moving in a ruined landscape someone just sitting making tea someone looking outside a window after after the second world war in a lot of these uh, often black and white movies even though color had been introduced um, was was a whole movement now obviously from a kind of european continental philosophical perspective it sort of gives primacy to the war or to holocaust and the, the the biggest catastrophic event in history has already happened and there's nothing that can happen that will exceed this or something like that which is obviously a perspective that many people seem to share and um and um one of course can't deny the importance of or the grav the gravity of what a, what a what that war and the Holocaust produced. But one also knows that there's still so many um, places and conditions of uh, extreme like uh, situations of people, you know, uh, making ends meet. And so, in fact, here the treatment is not of necessarily the event has already happened. It's making work while the event is going on. In fact, breaking out of the logic of the event altogether. And therefore, all the fact that you all bring up the everyday boredom, revisiting a place, then actually open up something which is unlike excavating, even though your work sounds like it's about excavation, you're going in excavating folklore, excavating something that has happened in the past, and more actually as kind of just spending time with. So there's no excavation going on. There's just spending time with something. And this is something that was quite close to the way we were thinking about in the exhibition, which was um, staying with something and things staying on with us. So from the first iteration to the second, instead of excavating new voices, excavating images and their context, it's been much more about one thing staying with another us staying with something this long what does that do something staying with us that long so can i ask sorab maybe to talk about this relationship with time and this exhibition um actually uh, you know when you were saying that i was actually thinking that it could also be a case of uh, consciously resisting the noise with slowness because i feel like in each of the practices it's a very conscious decision um and also being very conscious of, you know, like Vasif knows that he comes from a certain practice in the beginning, but he comes to a slowness or boredom or khayal in a, in a conscious way. And same with uh, someone like Prantik who's talked about 
you know um the block the blockbuster film and uh because pranthik comes from the world of cinema where there is a lot of money at stake and expectations of a different kind so and pranthik is you know making films that uh, require that uh, you know uh, engagement which um, none of us really have that much time for anymore you know most of us in the way the world is heading and same with someone like um, you know uh, ashwarya who is uh, spending time to be able to let the kids open up that world you know uh, and and till the time when she's there with them till they take her you know if now that they become teenagers maybe she can't go further on but in a way i think that it requires a very conscious um, thread that they all are holding on to um, so i mean in terms of time i feel that um uh i mean it's a very broad question with different you know answers um in relation I, to I, the show because in relation to the show i mean um uh let me get back to this give me okay. like a few minutes to think about this okay, because sure. um i think uh, there was a similar question asked yesterday about duration which was more to do with the sonic element but mm-hmm. i think that, um and i'm still trying to like like i was trying to express myself to you like a few days ago which was uh from a distance um i had imagined this to be you know um uh, one iteration moving on to the next but somehow i'm seeing from here the second iteration emerge out of the first rather than the first leading to the second so my idea of time within the show is this kind of got a bit blurry you know i don't really it's a bit like prantik's film because i'm very conscious that he's taking you back into a certain point of history in uh, an imagined history but even within that i see time looping you know so i see the protagonist coming in i uh, i don't know what has happened before or after there is no sort of linearity even in him pinning down time back you know in the 6th century or whenever you know if i'm sorry i'm mm. i may have got that wrong but around that time um and and for me i think what that is doing is it's opening up something so rather than pinning it to the context of having occurred you know at a certain time because it does feel also contemporary because it, like he was talking about the heartbreak talking about the cut you know i saw the cutting of the hair of the main protagonist of sakisona where she cuts her hair and i i i do sense heartbreak so he's not even giving like um one thing is to take me back to time but even within that uh everything is left in clues you know in terms of it's it's quite fragmented this notion of time even back then um and i think that for me in a way um i would hope that the show even in terms of its existence right now in terms of um zenup for example you know uh it's about the today it's about you know where she writes about here in kashmir today you know and the only notion of time is from 2019 5th of august when you know there was a siege and then she talks about colonization but the idea of colonization is also for 30 years so she is very specific also in the in a very recent time whereas um uh bunu for example is also she's not giving you time but because in a way we recognize bunu we imagine it to be today i think it's only it, it's basically for example where wasif really stretched it uh to a sort of memory you know i think that um very like even if i think in terms of, like for me all of these works still come under documentary even some like prantik i think that where there is fictional film which is all about imagination in a way he is documenting time but not in a very concrete way you know not like stone in a way and i think that um when i was also imagining the exhibition uh, i was i was aware of um the function of photography a big function of photography to document even if it's an expression um but the documentation needed to be as open as possible so you know in terms of wasif and prantik it was about uh not letting it settle on to the present you know uh because very often we imagine that's the burden 
the imagined documentary to also be evidence, which is of now. Mm. So you mm. you are contextualizing it as now, and you can come back and pin it, you know, uh, and and then search further from that time. Whereas um, Wasif for me was in a way like you know how I in a way described uh, um, Danita's book in the exhibition, which was just throwing the pebble in a still pond and letting the ripples kind of open up. So. Both Prantek, Ashwarya, I mean, all, all three of them are for me, you know, that pebble dropping into um, the still pond, which is still now, but the ripples, you know, there is an echo. So I think, uh, I think I would, I would imagine, I would hope that the exhibition actually has echoes, which become almost like when we talk about the after image, you know, it's not just the current image that we have photographed, but the many after images which which in a way elongate time in a certain way i, I mean I, I don't want to abstract it more no thank you thank you i'm going to actually add a comment that alana hunt just wrote um, here hi alana um, and it's actually responding to something that even sorab and everyone else has kind of uh, brought up which is somewhere about this distinction that is often imposed onto documentary of being bearing witness so something some form is an act of looking or bearing witness and another form is an it's a form of acting in in the cinema that i was describing of the of the uh, of the new italian new realists there was this differentiation being made between those who were just looking and those who have the agency to or or the capacity to act and Alana shares a comment here, and I'll just read it out. She says, brings to mind some of my favorite words from Jacques Rancière. Emancipation, in, in, his, in those words, emancipation starts from the principle of equality. It begins when we dismiss the opposition between looking and acting and understanding that the distribution of the visible is itself part, it, uh, visible itself is part of the configuration of domination and subjection. It starts when we realize that looking is also actions that confirms or modifies that distribution and that interpreting the world is already a means of transforming it. Uh, thank you, Alana. Rancia, it certainly does ring a bell in a lot of the conversations we're having. But you know, I'm going to ask something a little bit uh, provocative. Um, and that is, you know, I mean, I have my own answer to it, but I'd love to hear all of yours. We're all talking about a different sensibility and attitude towards time, where the past, present, future are blurred. They're not as easy to distinguish. And, you know, I mean, I've been reading, and I'm sure so have you, as well as not just reading, we all know, we all have people, loved ones among us sometimes also, where uh, conditions of apprehending time, conditions of uh, a kind of, cerebral, mental, social stability are not available, where someone is mentally unwell. And that's where these time distributions really break down. It's hard to tell what is the past, what is the present, what future is actually haunting the present sometimes. So on the one hand, we are all socially concerned. We're all politically sharp in the way we're dealing with things. And we're talking about this kind of uh, a reworking of time, but we also know that uh, there's a way we're navigating it with some sense of stable ground or something, right? And there are those for whom this this partition partitioning between a now and somewhere else really breaks down, um, and that's a that's a condition. I mean, hard to even uh, imagine, but there is a difference, perhaps. And so, how do each of you? deal with that difference. And I don't mean to say compare it with a condition which is inaccessible to us, but how is the process, how are you calibrating this? Um, how are you dealing with this relationship of the past, present, future that gets blurred, that gets reorganized? Because clearly certain techniques, certain intuitions are being deployed to make this happen, right? Because if it really indeed did collapse, it would be a very different state of mind. So maybe I can ask uh, Wasif to begin. 
I think your uh, your phrase, that question so beautiful is difficult to speak <laughs> after that. Um, uh, I can only speak from uh, my perspective in a very small way. While I was um, thinking about Kerala, I was thinking about uh, how this, this small uh, or specific characters can exist in old Dhaka or old Dhaka allows them to exist. Uh, uh, like someone can live a life in a small room in a rooftop and just live within his obsession. Either his obsession is to collect smells or uh, walk in certain alleys at certain times or read certain books. Uh, but I think for me, it was also about resisting a certain speed which dictates by a certain sort of mood of production and which stops you to imagine a different life uh, which might, might not have value in different places but it might have value in, in, in some context. So for me that uh, re rejection as a mood of resistance was very crucial when I was thinking about all these small characters, even an old person um how he or she functions after life i mean after walking life in a family or in a social space what sort of space we have for them or how they look at outside through the window what they actually see uh, are they really looking at something or they are thinking about something um yes um mm -hmm. I'm a little bit lost after your question. I mm -hmm. can come back after. Uh, no, no, it, people, I think what I you have, said. I have, um, I have um, certain reflections about other things. One thing I will say that I think the reference are very crucial uh, in our life. You talked about Italian uh, new realist filmmaker. But for me, there were uh, two significant reference which helped me to recalibrate the way I think one is Abbas Kirostam, Italian, uh, Iranian filmmaker, mm -hmm. and who always talked about narrative and slowness, and who also talks about how audience uh, fall in sleep uh, looking at his film. Uh, and he thinks it's something extremely interesting and creative because the whole notion of how you will start finding start of the film and end of the film completely changes depending on when you wake up. Mm, uh, looking at the film and mm. also I remember when I was walking on Kyal uh, there was a Hindustani classical music concert in Dhaka organized by Bengal Foundation and um, while I was there in one winter evening uh, uh, this famous violinist uh, Subramaniam was playing a solo uh, piece for more than one and a half hour and I remember listening to his piece and imagining a completely um, a, some, a landscape which is almost like a desert and very rusty. And how he have compressed the whole sense of time, like a, a decade of uh, time in, in, in almost like zipped uh, in one and a half hour, but mm -hmm. completely in a uh, I don't know, I should not say spontaneous, but it's very different from how Western orchestras are composed, you know. Mm. Um, and these two references actually helped me uh, to walk on Kyal and uh, looking at this uh, different references. Mm. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Wasif. Um, I think what a, what a beautiful way to think about making a work. If your work can put someone to sleep, how beautiful is that? <laughs> Completely the opposite of the demand of stimulating. Um, Prantik Ashwarya, do either of you want to answer? Because there's a very specific, I think, I think Wasif just opened up a response, which is that this breakdown of time between past, present, future, different reorganization of time happens in states that, that are also specific and accessible to us. Because there is one, there's some sides of it, which we can only imagine or think about, but and falling in and out of sleep during the work uh, is itself doing something with time. Uh, do either of you want to respond? In the meantime, if anyone has uh, questions, comments, thoughts, please share them in the Q&A or chat and 
we'd raise them here. Uh, in fact, uh, Vasif said it very beautifully. I was also remembering the reference of Kirostami and what he said about falling asleep, uh, audience finding the film safe enough to fall asleep exactly. during the mm. screening, and uh, it means something else altogether. The film mm. becomes something else altogether. And uh, in response to your question, I was just thinking that uh, the answer, in, in, in fact, for the answer, we can look back to the many meanings of khayal itself of uh, being mindful or being lost in this reverie and uh, because we are always living in this anxiety of future of and a longingness for a sense of longing for the past so in that uh, what do you call um, push and pull of both these anxieties and the sense of longing we are never really in the at the present uh, so if we take khayal, even if we are lost in the thought of the future or in the past being physically at the present, it opens up a sense of the time or space because they both change in terms of viewing or experiencing or even in our memory. Like I, a few years ago, I went back to my school, my kindergarten where I studied and in my memory, the space, the way it was, it suddenly shrunk too much. Like, mm. of course, I haven't grown so tall and huge. Like. So I have seen me, I'm a very petite fellow. And not that physically the school can become small, neither have I become a giant. But in my imagination, it was a huge space because what that space in size meant when I was that age. <clears throat> now, when I go back to it, it seems to have just shrunk. I don't know what has happened over time, but our perception of the space and the dimensions also changes with time overall. So mm. I don't know why I shared that, but it just came up to my mind. <laughs> Oh, I think it, it, uh, all of these are interesting references of how time space are reorganized in our own lifetime sometimes. And, and um, it brings something very concrete, actually, in my view to it, uh, to something that might otherwise uh, be uh, almost hypothetical. Uh, it brings a very concrete element to this. You know, I was recently talking to someone uh, and saying that after losing someone close to me recently, and a few people, in fact, uh, recently, somehow my belief in afterlife has started uh, growing, that maybe there is such a thing as an afterlife, and they're nice and happy somewhere up there. Um, and then this person says, do you believe in afterlife? I said, I don't believe if afterlife exists, but I know that my belief in afterlife is real. No, no, the question was, do you believe afterlife is real? And I said, I don't know if afterlife is real, but I know my belief in afterlife is becoming real and so it's this is these i mean it's not unreal therefore because it's it's about me knowing my belief is real belief is becoming real and so it's i think these com complex but also concrete formations somewhere around our consciousness that also sometimes a work brings you into um i don't know if Ashwari or sorab want to add anything to this we have the last 10 minutes left and if anyone has questions do please come in Ashwarya, you want to go? <laughs> See, you dealt with folklore and children interpreting folklores. I think that already does a whole bunch of things. Yeah, I think the way I've always, like, I mean, at least like the space or like moments I go back to with Karinge is like when I was like much younger and like in Chennai, it was really hot in the afternoon and then your parents want you to sleep because they want to have some time also like like i used to like my grandmom used to put us to sleep i used to be on her lap and she used to be like telling us all these things which you're listening and then you're like in this dark room and you're like in an extremely vulnerable position in someone's lap as a child and you're like you're kind of processing what's happened till then you're like half asleep and you're hearing this other story she's telling you about something else to put you to sleep and it's kind of like this like very open and beautiful and I think that existed because there was this like willingness to like to be present and to hear it and to allow for all of them to enter and and I think like when I work in Lama Punji there is this feeling that we are in a space where there is a window left open for things and to come in and out from the past and maybe the future but there is just this willingness to kind of allow them to come and go which like the resistance is much lesser mm. and I think that's where I kind of find joy in to kind of like just let go a little bit maybe mm. thank you um, I have a question for Saurabh mm. 
I think um, it will be interesting, like especially in in um, your one of the last film, um, the lost uh, head and the bath. You know, you have dealt with the um, time and speed very differently, almost like exactly opposite of what we are talking about. And I I I also feel like there is also something reverse to the slowness and boredom, which is scream or storm. Uh, you know, anytime before a storm, there is a certain sense of, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, we say it in Bengali, gumot, where the, uh, there is no wind and there is a sense of claustrophobia and then everything uh, start blowing. Mm. And I think Sorab was always interested in this sort of certain set of expression, which can be loud or not really minimalistic, which I have drawn to in later part of my career. So if you can respond to... Uh, that expression of the sense of time you used in your last works, mm. also in the book, how you have edited in the coast. Mm. No, um, I mean, I think, I think um, because there's also a film called The Coast where it's the reverse, it's, it's very slow. And in fact, it's like, uh, you know, trying to look at the stillness of time in, in a moment and see. Um, but uh, The Lost and the Bird was, uh, I think, just a response to a collapsing of time that I'm feeling that is happening today. You know, I feel that what, what I feel like, like all, all three of you in your works give me a lot of generous space to look again. So when you talk about Abbas Kiarostami's films and him talking about people falling asleep and yet being able to wake up and pick up their own thread into back into the film, you know, uh, I think that that is a very sort of um, is it, that space is more and more needed. I feel today, um, in general, I feel that this overwhelming collapse of time is uh, creating a lot of uh, problems here, uh, you know, all over the world, and I think it's quite accentuated in our part of the world. I think that there are a lot of systems, the government systems and all, which are taking advantage of the fact that nobody really has the time anymore to verify, uh, you know. So once, and the government is using it, you know, they are um, in a way um, inserting some disruptions from their own uh, side and, and uh, riots are engineered, you know, uh, violence is engineered, uh, pogrom is you know, encouraged uh, against um, Muslims, for example, um, or, you know, people of certain communities are uh, lynched. But a lot of it is going viral. I think we also, if you think about even images, right, we were living in a time for many years, for many decades in the time of the iconic image. And I don't, I don't know if an iconic image is possible anymore, because I think now we are living in the age of the viral image. And I think that uh, even the image itself um, has a different relationship to time. It, in fact, a viral image will exist in great intensity today, and then it will extinguish. Like you know, if you think about pop culture, Gangnam Style, all of these, you know, things in pop culture that go viral for a brief moment, and they 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 like this very bright burning flame, and they extinguish really fast. Whereas um, the iconic was always more like a slow cooked meal. The more it lived, it also, I think, gathered more time, uh, which allowed me to maybe also change my relationship to it. You know, uh, even if you look at Steve McCurry's Afghan Girl, how like everyone sort of uh, loved the image at one time and today people find problems with that image. I think that's also, again, something to do with how that image has had that space given to it to exist for as long. Mm. And, and I mean, for me, the lost and the bird was, um, I was looking at that collapse because I feel like we are gathering more and more pace. Mm -hmm. um, and for example, right now, this conversation is in the bubble, but then we go out, the every day is also getting really fast unless one consciously creates, you know, uh, a slow way of living. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, which is why I'm saying that, you know, when Sabi was talking about um, the Italian films that were being made, um, which is why my response was that for me, I consciously see all of you as resisting a certain time that we are living in by choosing to be the slow. You know, I think slowness in a way is also a form of resistance for um, 
what you all choose to do and um going to sabi's question you know uh, in terms of um uh i would say the location with which one looks at time and mm -hmm. how you know uh not everyone is in that same location if i'm if i didn't i hope i didn't kind of because i think that's where mm -hmm. we also became relative about time mm -hmm. uh, yes. in the later conversations mm -hmm. i think what alana sen said about emancipation you know that it starts from the principle of equality i would actually mm -hmm. um maybe replace equality just for this part with listening mm -hmm. uh i think that in a way there is some something today connected to when when making work you know to be able to listen as well so when all everyone here is going back you know the question that you were asking about uh going back to a place and what's that like um in a way i see that the longer people are actually uh the longer all of us here i'm one of them you know all of us are going back to a place a community as you know to people to a milieu um i i actually think that we are the ones who are being slowly cooked you know um because i feel like there is a constant cycle of learning and learning that is happening uh, which became very uh, and even alana is it's actually nice that alana brought this thing of emancipation up because even if you look at uh alana's work you know um uh, cups of noon chai it's about actually listening it's about stopping time mm. having, having that conversation, conversation mm. to really be able to uh grow and and when i look at the show um if i look at for example kushal stable i see so many years collapsed into those few images on the table i see um you know Vasif's work, I see like mm, a movement of of time. You know, it's not just what I'm watching. It's it's in a way I'm also uh, the more I spend time with the work, I realize that it is durational beyond what I see as well. You know, and that sense comes. On the other hand, packet, for example, you know, with the the archive, it's something which is very present. So, in a way, I, I would imagine also the exhibition to be full of these. different pockets of time and i think that um yesterday we were talking about sound becoming echo locations of different intensities but always not in a hierarchical way because they all peaks but they all peaks of a different magnitude you know um mm -hmm. uh, but here for example i would also say that maybe today uh the peaks are in the form of time that we can look at it you know in terms of uh, how all these works exist how for example uh one can look back at kushal's work which has been done a little earlier mm. something has passed since then mm. and i've also written about kushal you know living on mm. his own right now mm. kushal has also yesterday talked about um you know uh manju chatterjee who helped him and uh through this through also life you know mm. taking care of him and um in a way when we are looking at the work we know that something has passed a certain life has passed a certain story has passed on the other hand there is the pockets of the ongoing as well you know in some parts of the exhibition so for me also i would say that uh, there is that sort of you know movement uh, for the viewer it's also about how the exhibition is hopefully cooking someone who is going in mm. to be able to open up more and i think that you know i have to i feel like i'm i'm thoroughly cooked every time i go and for me when i look at the coast even when I, because in the beginning i was saying that you know it's not just going to a place it's also going through a place and uh, for me to make the lost head in the bird and the book the coast i very consciously decided to go through a place and not spend too much time to also have something because i'm also in a way trying to look at the complicity of the image maker in all the violence around image uh images that exist and in a way of going through the place became a method for me to try and keep my images as much on the surface as possible because i think that we can sense you know time uh mm. across people's works mm. because of the mm. slowness or pace or whatever mm. but wow what an arc we started with a reverie an idea a thought taking care of something and we're ending with cooking being cooked being marinated becoming tender so we're also out of time 
but this was excellent and i think more than just being uh, being a conversation describing a work i think we were also interested in getting in the kinds of thoughts that are that that come into into the conversation via the exhibition and getting to know all of these references that you bring um, has been i think a very meaningful takeaway and a lot of metaphors actually just came in today i've made a note of a whole set of them um, so thank you very much um, the last that Sorab and I were in a, in a formal conversation was actually with Wasif for Chobi Mela. And I think what um, my big takeaway, at least today, is that the kinds of conversations that we are witnessing in these clusters, this is not just happening now. These seems to be happening in pockets and places all around. And at least with some of you, it's just you're just finding different places to have those wherever you get, whether it's in Chobi Mela, whether it's in Photo Kathmandu, whether it's here at the moment, I mean, it's a privilege for us to be part of this conversation. So, and therefore, these timelines, these metaphors, they're all obviously being cooked together. So on that note, um, I'm going to thank all of you and thank everyone who's attending. Uh, we're going to have our last transformation tomorrow of the exhibition, and it will be accompanied by a virtual tour at the very same time. And it's going to be about valves, a, a reference that actually has stayed with us since iteration one between Sorab and myself and thinking about archives as valves, not as sites which are accumulating and pulling and capturing something, but rather being valves through which things are passing and flowing out and being calibrated. So um, join us tomorrow, uh, same time, same place and uh, revisit us as these guys keep revisiting some places thank you again and good night thank you thank you everyone thank you thank you